Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kissin. And this is a show for you if you're bored of people arguing on the internet over subjects they know nothing about. At Trigonometry, we don't pretend to be the experts, we ask the experts. Our terrific guest this week is a writer and the author of The Tribe, Ben Cobley. Welcome to Trigonometry. Thank you very much. It's so great to have you here. Uh, before we get into the interview and we talk about the book itself and, and some of your thoughts, tell us a little bit about how you are, where you are, and how you've come to be sitting in this chair. Well, yeah, it's, it's been quite a, a long and strange journey in a way. Um, I mean, r maybe roughly about 10 years ago, I, I sort of stepped out um, to an extent of, you know, a normal sort of career um, where I was a business-to-business -business journalist. And, you know, I wanted to... I just had a niche that I wanted to scratch, really. And uh, I ended up kind of going part-time in the work and then exploring my own interests. So, you know, re reading a lot, including reading a lot of philosophy, um, literature, other stuff. Um, and at around about the same time, I also thought, um, I mean, I, I'd spent all my years, basically since university, sitting in pubs, uh, moaning about politics and knowing better and actually not really doing anything. So I've never done that. <laughs> yeah, so, so around that time I thought, like, why not get in and get your hands dirty? So, I mean, I've always been on the left uh, since, that, since university, well, before that, since school days. So I joined the Labour Party locally and, and got myself involved. Um, so like I say, this was maybe about 10 years ago. Um, so through doing that, uh, I mean, immediately sort of joining and, and getting involved both locally and on a more sort of national level, you know, just writing blogs and sort of getting involved in that kind of that thought world. Uh, I started, well, I saw very quickly how identity politics was just, was so strong, not just in the Labour Party, but in the wider left-wing movement. Um, so I qu started to explore that and, and started to write my own blogs around about you know, 2011 for Labour blogs, like I say, um, and and for quite a long time, sort of was exploring that through my writing, while also reading a lot of philosophy uh, and other stuff. So starting to work that into my own, you know, into my own writing and thoughts. Uh, as time went on, uh, and you know, being in Labour and being in that wider left sort of world. You know my my critique of identity politics, how you know how I could see that it was so powerful, um, but there were you know aspects which I not just disagreed with, but I thought were dangerous and bad. So, you know, I could see myself starting to pull away while you know I'd been quite involved at the beginning and, and re had really quite enjoyed it too. Um, so you're a passionate Labour activist at this point, right? Well, I mean, passionate is maybe pushing <laughs> a bit far. All right, a, a um, dedicated but, you know, Labour person. Dedicated, yeah, I was yeah. involved, and I thought, you know, and getting involved in a local party was a really good thing to do, you know, to get, I, I'd moved to a new area, so it was a great way to get to know that new area mm. and get to know new people who, you know, had similar sort of interests. Um, but yeah, this sort of stuff was what really interested me, you know, mm -hmm. the you know, diversity element, identity politics. And what um, was the response to some of your writing in those days? That's kind of 2011, 2012, where you're talking about identity politics. Within your world that you were in at the time, how did people... I think people tended to stay away from it, ignore it. There was, there was some very strong, aggressive response, you know, especially from some feminists at that time. Um, I mean, I remember I had a one person sort of on Twitter threatened to throw a knife in my face um, because I questioned the idea of the patriarchy. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's you know, it's it's funny and it's kind of ridiculous. It was also a bit genuinely scary, um, and uh, and it's kind of an element of the you know how powerful it was. Mm. You know that if you if you questioned it in an, in quite an honest way. You know, people would really come after you, and um, I was I was attacked by you know verbally uh, by politicians. Hey, words too. of violence, we know <laughs> that. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, you know, and you, you take it, but you still you still do. You know, it, it kind of takes you aback, and yeah. especially I think more in the power aspect of like you know if you say something out of turn, mm. 
you know, people do genuinely come after you. And, you know, that's politics and you, you accept it. But it's like, if you do it this, if you do this, they come after you. Um, so, um, I mean, eventually, I mean, it came to Corbyn getting elected. And I, mean, I knew, you know, quite a lot about his past, you know, his links with Islamists um, and other, you know, stuff that I disagree with. Um, you know, the anti-Semitism is kind of related to that. Um, so I was unhappy about that. So I, I was kind of edging away from Labour you know, on the edge of leaving. And then the Brexit thing ha happened and I, I decided for Brexit. You know, I was, I was quite narrowly for Brexit at the beginning. Um, but again, with that, the, the response that you got personally, but also as a, as a kind of group of Brexit supporters, even on the left, was, you know, really strong. And... I mean, seeing Alan Johnson, the you know the ex MP who's leading the Labour against Brexit campaign, you know when he came out and said that Brexiteers were extremists, it was kind of like this was the last straw, you know, mm. as well as being called a racist and anti-immigrant and, and ignorant and all the rest of it. So at that stage, I left Labour, um, but with the book, I'd started writing the book, I think in around about February 2015. So I'd already been working on it for quite a while at that time. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's I, I guess, my background is mm. as much as I can think of it now. So you've left Labour. Where are you mentally, politically now? Is there a home for someone like you who maybe has a kind of old school leftist view of certain things but doesn't buy into the diversity and identity politics side of things? Well, there hasn't been, but um, I think it's quite interesting. There are... There are things going on in, you know, you know, mostly underneath the surface at the moment um, in politics. Uh, so, I mean, I haven't, I mean, even when I was in Labour most of the time, I, I really felt I didn't really belong there. Mm. Um, but I, I kept on because of the local links, because, you know, you've got friends and, you know, you value those relationships. Uh, but, but um, I mean, now organisationally, there isn't that much, but there are a few things popping up. And, you know, I think with the, with the Brexit thing it has brought people together and there are organisations forming and you know existing ones which are, are kind of building up a bit more. So I think it's a very interesting time. Ben, you were mentioning about Corbyn. Now I get uh, a lot of people uh, talking about Corbyn and there's the links with anti-Semitism and I personally find it quite confusing because people allude to him being an anti-Semite is he an empty somewhat in your view? And actually, what evidence is there for this? Because it's quite a serious allegation, to, not that you have, but a lot of people label him with it. What do you think he is and what evidence is there for, for him being anti-Semitic, as it were? I, I would be very careful about calling him personally an anti-Semite. It's, it's more the people he's associated with and events he's gone to where you know, very overtly anti-Semitic stuff has been said, and yet these are people he's, he continues to associate with and, and events he, he's continued to go to. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's almost a guilt by association thing we're finding. And, I mean, mixed into it as well, of course, is that this is politics and people who are opposed to Corbyn can leap onto the anti-Semitism accusation and beat him with it. But there's, there is no smoke without fire. There is, you know, there is a genuine association there with a lot of anti-Semitic people. Well, in particular, was there anybody that you could actually pin something on and go, look, there was this instance, or is it this group, or anything? Well, like I say, I, I, you know, I'd, I'd be cautious about, about doing that. Um, and, I mean, with, with the book and my own researches, it isn't something I got really deep into. Yeah. Um, it's more, like I say, the, the associations um, uh, you know, that I've talked about. I'm glad yeah. you've taken that approach, actually, because I'm someone who's from a Jewish background. And I, I, what I start to see... Never is, stops banging on about it. Yeah, not anymore. <laughs> but the thing is, like, I, I'll, I'll joke about Jeremy Corbyn and anti-Semitism on stage because I think it's a stereotype that's out there that's funny. But I would never allege that he is anti-Semitic because I've never met him. I don't know if he's anti-Semitic. And what I resent most of all is Jews now being encouraged to play the stupid identity politics game from our end as well. 
You know, it's like, oh, well, there's guilt by association. Maybe he went to this event. It's like, well, maybe he did and maybe he didn't. You know, we, we don't know. And until there's hardcore evidence, I think it's much better to take your approach, which is to go, we're going to be very careful about this and we're not going to make yes, personal I th allegations. Yes, I think, I mean, I think it's, it's coming back some of this. Sorry, I haven't thought about a lot of stuff in, in depth mm -hmm. for a while. But it is coming back some of the aspects, you know, which you can actually pin on him. And the classic one for me that really turned my head was when I saw the video of him, uh, you know, very overtly calling Hamas and Hezbollah our friends, mm. you know, our friends, mm. um, at a, an event, I think, in Westminster. Um, and he's invited, you know, these people to Westminster for events. Now, Hamas, in its founding documents, you know, has overtly anti-Semitic statements. It, you know, it talks about chasing Jews mm. and killing them. Mm. And for me to, to embrace Hamas on that aspect and say they are your friends, I mean, obviously it's, a, it's an indirect association, yeah. but it's a strong one, I think. I, I hear um, what you're saying, but what I mean is like, if I think, I don't like Jeremy Corbyn's politics on many things, but if I look at him, do I think this is a hateful person? that hates Jews, which is what anti-Semitism, mm. I don't think so. Or yeah, at least so I, I don't that, know, yeah. right? So I think all sides need to be really careful about, it's very easy, like when this story happened with me before Christmas, so many people were like, look, talk, go on TV and talk about how you're Jewish and how you're oppressed. I'm like, no, we don't, we're not gonna play the left, the, the radical loony left identity politics game from our end, because it's stupid. We're saying the game is broken. Let's stop playing that game. Do you mm. know what I mean? Mm. So I think the stuff about Jeremy Corbyn's being anti-Semitic, it's funny to joke about as a comedian, but I really don't think we should focus on it quite as much as we have been, Francis. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let's talk about your book because this is what this is really about. The, the subtitle of the book is The Liberal Left and the System of Diversity. And in the, in the preface to the book, you talk very carefully about how you, you're... You, you, you say you're being critical of some of these things, but actually as both Francis and I read the book, I think our, certainly my impression was that you're not being critical, you're describing it as it is. And unfortunately, some of the things that you're describing are the way they are is so broken that it seems like you're being critical when you're actually describing. So talk to us about, when you talk about the system of diversity, what do you really mean by that? Well, I mean, in terms of it, of diversity being a system. Um, I mean, it, I, I, it's a form of politics. Um, you can say there's an ideology um, of diversity out there. But in terms of a system, I'm, I'm talking about that there are relations there, you know, which kind of work in a systemic aspect. You know, so I, if I say something on, on social media, for example, I, I accuse uh, someone famous of being racist or something. It's like there, there's a ready audience for that sort of uh, um, statement. So I can make a call out there and I'll get a favorable response. And, and, it'll, and it'll gain a, it's likely to gain quite a favorable hearing in, you know, in the newspapers, especially you know, the more well-known I am. Um, you know, I'm, I'm likely to gain publicity and sympathy by saying that, whether it's true or not. Um, now, so in terms of it being a system, it's like, uh, we can see possibilities there um, for acting in, in certain ways, um, which will, you know, benefit us in, in different ways. Um, uh, there's also the aspect, of course, of um, institutionalising diversity, which, you know, through rules and laws. So, I mean, we, we've been seeing that a lot over, you know, past few years with um, the spread of positive discrimination, although it's now redefined as positive action. Oh, is it? Um, okay. Okay. I think to partly... Let's update our vocabulary, mate. <laughs> partly to stop calling it discrimination. Because right. it reveals what it actually discrimination is. Discrimination yeah. is a bad thing, yeah. you know, in, yeah. in, in, in the language. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the more it's kind of institutionalised, the more sort of favour you have towards certain identity groups and others, again, it, that, that creates more possibilities, you know, for... For getting jobs, or, or if you if you oppose this sort of thing, for losing your job, um, or if you have the ro the wrong identity and you pr promote that identity, for example, you know myself, yourselves as well as white males. If we promoted ourselves as white males, 
that wouldn't go down well in a lot of our institutions. Yeah, that's why so I talk about Jewish or being Jewish all the time. That's why I talk about being half Latin America. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But actually, it's funny because I always talk about this. Like in Russia, someone who looks like me would be considered black. I had people when I was living in Russia tell me, go home, you're black. So it, it, the, the identity thing is like, I, I've had it on both ends. I've been the white man, the straight white man mm. in this country, and I've also been the oppressed minority. And uh, it, that's why I, I feel really strongly about this stuff is because these are all just labels, really. That's what they are. You know what I mean? Like looking at someone and judging them by what you think they are is, is a very superficial way of living life. I think it is on one level, and I agree with you. But, you know, as I worked on the book, I started to realise that, you know, there is a real significance to it as much as we give it significance. Mm. Um, so, for example, you know, the more, ident you know, the more uh, say, uh, um, female identity is politicised in public life, that also politicises a male identity, especially if... If that form of identity politics is saying that men are a bad thing, you know, talking about the patriarchy or something, um, that automatically politicizes men and makes it part, makes being male a part of the public sphere. And, you know, in, in one way or another, we, we, we have to address that, you know, and we can address it by going, oh, it, you know, it, it shouldn't matter. But it does matter. And, uh, you know, that's. That's as far as I got, yeah, yeah. I mean, but isn't there a positive element to it when it comes to diversity mm. qualities, where it just it does give other people who have been underrepresented a voice? I mean, there was one time at the BBC where it just seemed to be, unless mm. you were white, middle class, or actually, let's be fair, upper middle class, went to Oxford or Cambridge, you didn't really get to look in. Mm. So during the, uh, the Christmas holidays, I went to a play called Nine Night, uh, which was on at the West End, which was on at the National Theatre, and it was by... It was the first play at the West End to be um, to be have a black female playwright ever. The first one mm. we went to the play. It was brilliant, and what was great mm. about it is instead of going to the theatre and being surrounded by people of one demographic, you looked out. There were mixed couples there. There it was diverse, and it actually created a really vibrant, interesting uh, experience. Yes, I, I completely agree with you, and and even with you know if that playwright, for example was selected on the basis of their race. If they were a good playwright, you know, and they produced good plays, you know, it, it can work well. And, and I've, I've, I've seen, well, that I think there's quite a few examples of it out there. I mean, I, I quite like how, you know, for example, women's football and women's cricket has been directly promoted, you know, and that's a form of identity politics in, in the public sphere. And it's been, it's been a big success. Uh, I think there, 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 are, there are other examples out there. Um, the, the point where it comes into a critique uh, is when, you know, the people being promoted are not, are, are not good or, you know, not up to standard and you're only selecting them on the basis of, you know, their identity. You know, then, and then it can obviously get us into trouble and just reduce the quality of, of art, of, you know, of, of sport that's appearing in front of us, etc. But yeah, I agree with you, you know, it's, it's not by, by all means all bad. And I mean, one thing in one of the chapters I write about, um, about diversity itself as a word, you know, there are different interpretations of that. I mean, the politics of diversity, the ideology of it, mm. is actually different from the meaning of the word diversity itself, which means literally you know, variation and difference. Mm. Well, the politics of diversity isn't really about variation and difference. It's, it's often about choosing certain people over others, you know, on the basis of, you know, their skin colour and their gender, etc. It's interesting that you say that because isn't there an argument to be made that, so for instance, um, if somebody isn't as good, let's say, well, let's say for instance, a comedian, just plucking something out the air, but and they're not as good. But a don't young, worry, mate. You'll get your opportunities. You'll be fine. Don't worry about it. But they see them on a pa like, for instance, on a panel show. Like, for instance, uh, I, 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 so for instance, like a, a black woman on a panel show, and she she might not be at the same level as everybody else. But a young a black girl could see her and go, actually, I can do that. 
because I am represented on this TV programme. Therefore, that becomes, for me, suddenly a career path that I can choose and pursue. Mm. Whereas if that young black girl saw an all-white male panel, she might go instinctively or subconsciously, do you know what? Then I'm not represented there. Therefore, I will not. I, I, that is not a career path for me. Yes, I, I can see aspects of that, yeah. um, which, you know, I agree with you to an extent. But the further we go down that path of identifying with our skin colour, the further away, or our gender or whatever, the further away we get from the idea of being inspired by ideas and by quality mm -hmm. and by what someone is saying. For example, I mean, I, I would say sort of my ideal situation would be you know, someone watching that program, program sees someone, whoever, whatever colour mm. or gender, saying something that interests them and being inspired by that and almost, you know, their, their demographic is almost irrelevant. I mean, that's, that's the way I would see a kind of an ideal sort of diverse society sort of working. And the more we go down our sort of avenues of separate identities and, and you know, that the, you, you must be represented by people of of that demographic. I think, you know, there are aspects that that's quite dangerous because um, it's, uh, it's cordoning off, you know, it's, it's communal, it ends up in communal politics really. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I, I like the idea, I mean, the other idea of, of diversity, which is mixing and difference and, you know, exchange going on. Do you, do you sometimes think, and I, and I think the BBC is particularly <clears throat> guilty of this in that I, I see some be it be more diverse which on the whole i think is a positive thing but what i do not see a lot of the time is a diversity of opinion so it's essentially mm. people who look different but they spout the same sort of rhetoric or have the same political opinions or viewpoints on the world mm. i mean this is the sort of thing that I'm, I'm talking about in the book and what i mean by the system of diversity mm. yeah. again is i mean it's it's not all obviously what you know people who appear on TV and especially in the BBC, that it's, it's not all obviously related to diversity and identity yeah. politics, yeah. but an awful lot of it is. And, and what I write about it in, in, in the book is um, that the system of diversity, the fundamental relations there are between, you know, what we might, might call, you know, the liberal left, as I call it, or the progressive liberal left, which is a, a really a group of people who oversee society. And, you know, so, so, for example, if you work for the BBC, you're in a position where you can help oversee, you know, what millions of people sort of watch and, and hear every day. So you've got a very privileged position there. And, you know, people are conscious of that. They, you know, quite rightly, they see it as a responsibility, you know, of what they show. Um, but um, the relation there in, in terms of diversity politics and identity politics is often that they're, they're overseeing society to cast favour on some identity groups, you know, which, as you say, have been traditionally maybe un underrepresented and look to represent them more in a positive light. Um, and then, obviously, with, with the other groups, that means, you know, the unfavoured groups, as I call them, that's to cast them in a more negative light, as sort of oppressors, and then the favoured groups as the oppressed. Um, so uh, I, I don't know, I, f I forget what the original um, point was and where, where I'm we going. We were talking actually. about diversity of opinion. So. Div so diversity of opinion, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a basic relation and it's a, it's a form of knowledge that this is how the world works, is that oppressor groups oppress, um, oppress you know, the oppressed groups, mm. favoured groups, um, victimise the, the unfavoured groups. And so you, you see a, an awful lot of that in our public sphere now. And if you, you know, if you look at the BBC website, you'll see a, a lot of stories which are based around that sort of relation um, of, you know, for example, women being victims and, or, of men and, uh, and stories being told about that. And I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm not against those stories being told at all, you know, if, if they're real. But it's, it's, an, it's an interesting thing that's come about more over the years, that that sort of reality is promoted and, and placed in front of us a lot more. Um, and situations which don't reflect that reality do not so much get put in, 
in front of us, you know, when we're watching the you know, BBC News or something like that. I hope that, I hope I wasn't waffling. I hope that no, 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 no. What I was going to ask you is, do you think there's a kind of intellectual, philosophical underpinning to this whole thing? Because it strikes me increasingly that this whole thing of uh, social justice and identity politics, it's more like a system of faith than it is a system of thought, in the sense that quite a lot of the, the things that they talk about are not factually based. So take something like the gender pay gap, right? Mm -hmm. This is something we've explored plenty on the show. and We've had scientists and experts come and tell us basically that the gender pay gap, there is some gender pay gap, but largely it's down to people's choices and it's not down to discrimination, right? But this is completely counter to the mainstream narrative that is being ad advanced the whole time, right? And if you look at all kinds of other areas, whether it's racial discrimination. We've talked to Minira Mirza, who you know, mm. about how complicated that picture actually is as opposed mm. to the thing that we're being fed by the media all the time. Uh, wherever you look, you start to see that their assertions about the way the world is, what you're talking about, oppressed as oppressed, the hierarchy of the oppression Olympics, etc., it's not actually based in fact, right? It's not based on research. It's not based on science. It's based on a kind of seeming, it seems to me, and challenge me if you don't agree, a kind of like you have to get this faith-based assertion into your head. Mm. And if you don't, then you must be excommunicated. Mm. Then you're racist, then you're sexist, then you're whatever. Yes. There's certainly that element to it. Um, I mean, I, I, would, I would describe it more as ideological, mm. you know, in that it's uh, this, these forms of policy, they, they unite knowledge and politics. You know, the knowledge of oppression, it automatically follows that you should favour the, the groups that oppress. You know, that makes basic sense. Um, but that knowledge of oppression is universal. You know, it's, it's, it's society wide. So, I mean, I, I draw a distinction between, for example, when we talk about racism or sexism or whatever, I mean, it you know, clearly exists, but there's, there's real actual behavioural racism that exists. Mm. And then there's ideological racism, which, which is a much broader category. And that's Can where... Can you give us a, what, when you say ideological racism, what kind of thing are you talking about? Well, um, it's, it's, for example, calling someone racist, you know, if, you, if, you, if, if they want to, if, if they advocate reducing immigration. Hmm. You know, so, you know, in, in, in the sort of way I, I write about it in the book, you know, reducing immigration would be reducing the increase of favoured groups, you know, immigrants, you know, non-white people, non-English, non-British people in the country. So that goes against the sort of the politics of diversity. And, you know, if you're an anti-racist, uh, you, you naturally think, well, you, you can be easily led to think, well, if I'm, if I'm on this side as an anti-racist and uh, I favour immigration, then, you know, someone who who wants to put some limits on it is automatically a racist. It kind of, maybe I'm not explaining that well. No, but you explain it, it very but well. But it yeah. all, but it all sort of seems to fit again as a as a sort of system of belief. Yeah. So that you can have faith in, and you mentioned, uh, you know, there's not so much thought, you know, sort of intellectual basis theory. That's in a way what makes it so powerful. This forms of politics that you can just get up every morning and you can roll it out. You don't have to really do any think, thinking mm. about it. You can re respond to situations as they arise on that basis. Uh, and it's easy. Sounds know. great, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think no, I'm going to do it. That sounds yeah, brilliant. No, no, absolutely. I mean, that's how you know, effective politics works. And I, you know, it's, it's a big theme of the book. And as I was working towards uh, you know, actually starting to write it and then writing it, it kept on striking me how powerful this politics is and and over time I start to realize more and more it's largely because it's just damn easy hmm. it's so straightforward all you need to know is that these these certain identity groups are, are victimized and these other ones are oppressors and and from there almost all else follows <laughs>I think I find really interesting with identity politics is how it sort of ignores the working class in this country. Mm. 
and you know, especially the white working class. And if you look at it in terms of, like, I'm a former teacher, so in terms of achievement, mm. white working class boys mm. on the bottom rung, and it's a problem right the way through mm. education. And we talk about, you know, and we, you know, we as teachers we used to sit down and talk about how to engage white British and all the rest of it, but. We don't seem to acknowledge that class has a major part to play in this. Mm. A lot of people say, like, you know, white men are the oppressors. But if you were born, like, I used to teach in Cornwall. If you were a white male born in a working class part of Red Ruth, for example, you don't have a lot of hope or a lot of chance unless you're very, very lucky. Mm. That's just your white privilege talking. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah that's, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's... Uh, and, uh, Sorry, I'm, I'm going to return to this whole system of diversity thing um, of how that works. Because, I mean, obviously the, the working class appears to be kind of ignored. And, you know, people talk about, oh, the, the left has left the working class behind. But I don't think many, many people on the left have intended necessarily to do that. Although there's, there's a definite cultural distance there. There's just kind of basic lack of sympathy, lack of familiarity, lack of knowledge, which we used to have back in the day, of course. Mm. You know, it's, um, it's kind of almost going back to a very for old form of class politics, mm. I think. But I think it's happened largely by accident. Um, but yeah, going back to the system of diversity, I think, you know, the, these new forms of identity politics are very important in this, in what's happened to the working class. Not the only important thing by any means, but... It's, you know, especially white working class people. But, um, and, and it goes back, I think, to um, what I talked about, you know, the overseeing class, for example, of the progressive liberal left. And this, this has become more of a sort of a template for, for how, you know, white people can get over their privilege, you know, for example, or white men can get over their, their multiple privilege is by favouring the favoured groups. Now this... Being an ally. Yes, yeah. and, and this... This naturally uh, suits people who are quite well off, quite comfortable. You know, they can deal with that. Um, they have some cushioning against uh, passing favour over to other people. But if you're working class, the idea of, of favouring a, a different group other than your own and giving them special protections and, and favouritism when, especially if you're, if you're competing with Say, say, poor immigrants, you know, in, in for housing and, and for jobs. Just existentially, that, that sort of, that idea, I think, is almost incomprehensible, you know, if you're in that sort of situation. So I think these forms of politics have, have resulted in the further distancing, you know, cultural distancing there, you know, both on the working class side and also on, you know, from the aggressive liberal left and the wider middle class, I think, you know. I find it really refreshing that you've raised that point because what I've noticed, in, particularly when doing comedy, which is very liberal left in inverted commas, is the contempt they have for working class people. So I used to live in, in Croydon, and for those of you in our, in our global audience who don't know Croydon, it's a beautiful place, go there if, you, if you're visiting. If you want to <laughs> die, go there. <laughs> right, so I used to live in Croydon. My flatmate um, was a mixed race plumber, and he was a UKIP voter. No, mixed race electrician, sorry. And he was a UKIP voter. And I said, it's all the same, mate. Yeah. And I sat him down and I, and I said to him, Dan, wh why, why, I don't get why you vote for UKIP. You know, you're mixed race. Isn't this a racist party? And he also voted Brexit as well. And he was like, see, the thing you need to understand, Francis, is that because of freedom of trade from the EU, lots of people come over here and they can do my job. And I've got no problem with that as people. They're nice people. I work with them. They're decent lads. The problem is, is that then that means that my rate of pay gets put down as a result because there is more competition. Mm. So by voting Brexit, I am protecting myself economically and financially. Mm. And when you hear someone p put that argument forward, you go, well, fair enough, because that's what we do when we vote. We just, we just vote for our own interests. But why is it that that is, if this working class person does that, that is deemed to be racist? Yet, if you have the other side of it, that's acceptable. Um, sorry, I'm a bit lost for words. It's, it's, no, no, it's fine. Francis it's, has that effect it's, it's on people. people. Yeah, <laughs> mainly women, mate. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess what he's saying is, how come is it? It's okay for 
certain people to vote in favor of the economic interests, yeah. but not for others in, in the system that we live in. Yeah. Well, I, th I, th I think, you know, it's, it's largely down to, you know, a certain type of people are, are controlling, you know, the chattering classes, you might say, mm. you know, who are largely controlling debate, you know, yeah. and, and how, how, how opinions appear and what opinions appear. And obviously, I mean, working class voices, I mean, we, we know it, they, they barely exist in our public life now, um, which is actually a, a bit of a change from, I think, back in the 60s and 70s when they were coming more and more into public life. And now they're becoming more and more marginalised. Um, so I think, I think it's partly that. But, uh, but, you know, and that distancing, obviously, it kind of, it helps, you know, it helps us you know, to be ignorant about people. You know, if we, we kind of all share the same sort of opinion, uh, and we, we don't know these people, we don't sort of respect their views. I was going to ask you, in terms of the, the left abandoning working people, it's like, if I look at it, and I imagine that I, that's where I am, and I look at the political system now, I don't really see a party to vote for. I think a lot of, a lot of the kind of traditional old school left people would have voted for UKIP at some point, mm. um, particularly while Brexit hadn't been achieved yet. But now you're not going to vote for Labour under Jeremy Corbyn. You're probably not going to go vote Tory. UKIP is in disarray. So where, where do those people go? Our current party system doesn't offer anywhere mm. you know, for, for people like that. And it's a very large body of population. And, I, and I've seen from other people you've interviewed that they've said, you know, there's a big gap there. And, and if anyone can plug that gap, they can win elections. Mm. But, but we can certainly see none of the established parties have any intention of filling that gap. And I mean, it's one thing that I write in the book that, you know, I mean, my, my emotion is, is still, you know, even after leaving Labour and criticising it sort of extensively, I still have a bit of love for Labour and I would still like it to change and become more of a meanable party to, to a greater body of people. But through writing the book and, you know, and thinking a lot about this sort of stuff, I realised it was virtually impossible for it to, for to, to, to do that. Why? Because it's become so immersed in the politics of identity, it's almost the first thing that a lot of its people reach for. And we see this in the public sphere continually. You know, there are set, normally several identity politics storms happening in our public sphere at any one time. Mm. And you can bet that Labour people and senior Labour people, Labour MPs, are going to be involved in that. And they're going to be fighting on one side. Mm. Um, and uh, I mean, one thing that I did in the book, before the book, was I looked into um, the rule book. Because I, I noticed, you know, being Labour, how uh, politics of identity preferentiality was all over just internal labour processes from you know how you selected who went to conference to selecting candidates you know who could serve in a you know a, a very local ward committee you had to have to have a certain amount of women um, you've got uh, officers which you know specifically represent different identity groups and it's if it's these favoured identity groups it's non-white and it's uh and it's women and, and, and some other groups. So, I mean, I, I, I looked into, like I say, the rule book, and I found, I think, in like 90 odd pages of it, that there were, I think, something like 250, 300 mentions of, of women, women, and gender alone. And it was maybe about a, th a third of that, maybe a bit more for ethnic related categories. So, 90 pages, you've got maybe um, three mentions on average of this gender, ca gender and gender related mm. categories on every page. And this is how the party does its internal business. And activists have been fighting to control the rule book like this for years. You know, they've been fighting for decades to achieve this sort of thing. And you can't just like go, oh, we're not, in we're not into this anymore. Because, you know, this stuff is institutionalized into the party. It's worked into it. And we're seeing this uh, more and more in the public sphere. You know, the similar, similar sort of stuff that Labour has done, you know, with 
preferentiality by, by identity. We're seeing replicated in all sorts of institutions, you know, national institutions like the BBC, uh, other media organisations, for example, um, charities and even businesses. You know, it's, it's you know, almost labour, you know, I've written about as an institution of diversity which provides a, a template for this sort of preferentiality. And the more it gets worked into institutions and is the basis on which they conduct their internal affairs, you know, the less easy it is to change it. And, so, and we haven't got any, returning to your point about yeah. political parties, yeah. you know, we haven't got any political party which is, you know, any major political party anyway, which is even at the threshold of addressing the consequences of that and whether that's all such a good idea. So this is what I was going to ask you before, uh, Francis, you jump in. What does it mean to be left anymore? Because one of the big criticisms that we get is we talk to a lot of people who are kind of in your position, who, who are coming from the left, but are frustrated about this obsession with identity politics and diversity and social justice. There. And people say to us, well, all you do is you just get right wing guests on. And we're like, they're not right wing. They're just not part of that. So wh wh where does that leave someone like you? How, how, what, what, what are your leftist credentials? What makes you someone of the left still? I still consider the self, yeah, definitely of the left. And it's, but it more comes down to economics and, and redistribution. You could say class, although I'm, I'm a bit reluctant to get into these categories of set categories, you are this and that. Especially since I think in one aspect we're the working class now, which I think is quite interesting that literally as a category, it doesn't make sense anymore. You know, the working class was formed around organized labor and large scale industry, which is now largely gone now. Mm. So it's, it's more of an existential category, which you know, is something that you feel, yeah. but it doesn't necessarily define how, how rich or poor you are. Um, so, I mean, I, I think it's quite difficult to, to do that, but in terms of being left, I mean, I, I, I still believe in redressing inequalities generally in, in society and addressing the dominance of the finance industry, for example, the City of London here. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that, that sort of stuff is it's mostly around economics and finance, I'd say. Well, you know, the, the sort of the, the left's now social agenda a lot of it I find very alienating because it is based around identity. The thing that I find interesting when it comes to Labour is they don't seem as interested as in, in winning elections, which I, I find really, really bizarre. Like after the last general election, the, I was talking to friends who are very progressive left and voted Corbyn, and they were talking about the last election like it was a victory. And I'm like, I don't think you understand. You still lost. When did... When did Labour, and I, I voted Labour, when, when did we lose this, this idea of wanting to win an election? Well, I think that's, that's the change from, you know, the new Labour compact in the Labour Party to the Corbyn one. You know, it's a, it's a and you could say maybe the Ed Miliband regime was a, was a kind of a crossover to that. Um, because new Labour, it, it came to be, you know, largely defined by winning elections. That was the... That was a large part of the faith. Although, I mean, looking back on it now, and, you know, this is something I explored in the book, of, you know, starting to realise how ideological Labour was underneath it all. But on the surface, they were, they were very much concerned with just winning elections, really. And, but that enables you to, to roll out your programmes, you know, and stuff which isn't necessarily in your manifesto. Um, so I think, yeah, that changed to... First Ed Miliband and then the far left, uh, you know, that they've been, that, that sort of, that side of the Labour Party has been out of power basically forever. You know, they're not used to it. And so they, so, so their sort of sense of being, it's not, it's not so attached, what they value is not so attached with actually having power, you know. Um, so I'd say it's more, it's more about familiarity as much as anything. But isn't that the point of a political party to get, I know, to get into power? Or am I just losing sight of it? You know, it's, you, you want to you impose your programme. So, I mean, there's compromises to be made. You know, how, how, how much are you sort of purist about your programme, what you want to do if you got into power? 
and then how much are you prepared to actually sort of address the electorate as a group? And I mean, that's a, that's a sort of balancing act, really, as I see it. And the thing that I find particularly interesting when it comes, we talk about the hierarchies of privilege. The, the, the number one, the apex for a hierarchy of privilege seems to be old white men, which to me seems incredibly ageist because a lot of old people in this country, quite frankly, are struggling economically, financially. <laughs> you know, they can barely, they're barely able to get through the month. Yeah, I th but that, you know, like we were saying earlier about sort of facts and reality isn't really what this, these forms of <laughs> politics are all about. And, it, you know, it's ideological. And I think the ver an in interesting aspect with older people is that they appear as being regressive and backward. Mm. And, uh, and for example, I mean, you, you could say there is some reason for, for saying that, you know, for example, that racist maybe uh, sexist attitudes in, in a certain sense are more common amongst you know, older people of, of previous generations. Um, but I, that, that's more of an excuse, I think, to sort of bash them. But I think it's, this is where progressive, you know, the progressive element of politics comes in because progressive politics is really about, it's about things improving over time, getting better over time. And it's a faith that that's happening. Mm. Um, so in that sense, people who are around, you know, in previous times are naturally sort of worse and more regressive than, you know, young people, for example. So you, you find sort of progressive politicians, they tend to exalt the younger and then dismiss the older, which, I mean, I agree with you. I think that's a really bad way of, you know, addressing, especially from a left, solidarity in society, you know, of dismissing people who have been on this earth for a lot longer than we have, have a lot more experience, and just dismissing them as if they have nothing valuable to offer. I think that's, that's a terrible approach. So you might, I think there should be like a cutoff point for like white privilege once you get to like 70. <laughs> yeah. you've, you've got some kind of wasting you know, disease that takes <laughs> away your privileges and you just... That's yeah, what it's happens. called osteoporosis. Yeah, exactly. That's it. <laughs> Thank you for taking that, that joke into a very, very dark place. <laughs> That's what I do, man. But it's interesting because when people criticise Trump, a number of times when what I saw from people was like, what do you expect? He's an old white man. And it was just like, of all the things, like, I don't agree with Trump. And, and yeah, you the, do. Yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, the moment when he said, my mum's Venezuelan, that Venezuelans can't go into America, I fully agreed with it. <laughs> um, but no, I... But... It just seems such a bizarre thing to accuse somebody of, you know, it's saying he's old, he's an old white male, therefore he has these views. It comes back to it's just so easy, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know, this, again, what I'm talking about with sort of system of diversity, it's like, you can say that. Say if you said that on Twitter, you know, you, you see people saying that on Twitter, they'll get thousands of retweets. Shit, I need to do you know. that. Yeah, that's no, what no. I need to do, yeah, mate. No, so that, that's the only you, way your comedy career is going to take <laughs> off, mate. Yeah. If you want to be popular... Yeah. You know, you can do that. You just make these kind of lazy remarks and, you know, that, that kind of gets you a lot of approval. And, you know, it's, it's an effective form of politics. You know, it's so easy. We can all grab hold of it and, and sort of do it. There you go, guys. If you want to be a social media influencer, you know what to do. Yeah. You know where to take it. He got fat shamed to hell as well, Trump, didn't he? Yeah, he, he did. It's yeah. perfectly respectable to, to fat shame Donald Trump. <laughs> It is, although he does fact shame other people. So, yeah. so I mean, you can say, I mean, it's a taste of his own medicine. But he, does, he has got a fat ass, to be honest. How do you know? I've Have seen ever... it. I've seen pictures of it. Have you? Yeah. So, so you've looked at it and yeah. you've yeah. studied that rum. Oh. Yeah, I have. I have. Well, I have. Nice to know what kind of porn you watch. Anyway. <laughs> uh, Anyway, uh, we're, we're getting towards the end of our interview. And one of the things that we uh, wanted to talk to you about, you talk um, about a couple of things which I think are really important. And let, let's get to both of them before we, we ask our very final question. First of all, you talk about the false power of prediction. People talking about how this is what's going to happen and then this is what's going to happen. If we don't do that, then this is going to happen. And eventually none of it happens. And we all keep going as if, if, if this those predictions hadn't been made, you know, and that person didn't lose any credibility. We just mm. keep predicting stuff that never happens mm. and then just carry on as if everything is the same. So mm. talk, talk, talk to us about that bit. Well, I think it's, uh, it comes down to, you know, the authority that appears from knowledge. And, you know, obviously there's a, there's a good reason for mm. that, you know. Um, 
But obviously it depends on if the, the knowledge is actually real or not. Now the thing with predictions is, you know, by definition, the truth is not verified. You know, you, you can't tell what's going to happen before it. But predictions appear as if they are truthful, you know, especially if they come from someone, you know, who is authoritative, you know, who works for, say, the Bank of England, um, you know, a, a big organisation, big international organisation, you know, anyone who produces reports. So basically anyone who's, you know, sort of organised uh, and they, they can produce something which appears authoritative and you can make predictions. And, and that appears as a form of knowledge. Uh, but it's obviously... Um, it's it's obviously sort of well well you you know like I said before you can't verify it either way, um, so the predictions kind of appear in the public sphere as authoritative and there's no way to to demonstrate that until whatever they predicted either happens or doesn't and of course by the time that happens the whole the whole circus has moved on mm. so you can you can predict another thing. Um, and With the same level of authority. Yeah, as long, as long as you have the position and the ability to, you know, contact the media and they, you know, the authority and and the receptivity from the media to, to get your stuff out there, you can keep on, you know, replaying it, and it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, some people are obviously going to pick you up on it, but most people out there are not really paying attention. Do you realise what you've just done is given a blueprint to how to become a Guardian journalist? <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't possibly. <laughs> and then just at the end, fuck old people. Yeah. And then that's it. You're there. But I mean, it's interesting, like you know, because it does seem to be that you can make these, you know, these grandiose predictions, and everybody discusses it, and then the next week we go on to mm. something else. And really, isn't the only point of a prediction so that you can end it with four words? Told, I told you so. I mean, that's essentially it, isn't it? And then, then people go back to it and then go, look how well, I was right. Well, I mean, that, that would be the, you know, the you know, approach which follows, you know, the, the disciplines of theory and knowledge and checking and falsifying mm. and, and, and then, you know, you looking to revise your theories and all the rest of it. But politics isn't like that, you know. It's, it's, it's more about authority and, and getting your thing out there. Yeah, so it's, it's not I told you so, it's it's about what you're telling people is going to happen. Yeah. And then that allows you to control what happens in the present, right? Yes. It's, it's about yes. shaping the message today so that different decisions get made because you predicted something. Precisely. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Another final point I wanted to ask you about as well is you talk about, you know, one of my, uh, one of the, uh, we're very big fans of Dave Rubin and his show, and he talks a lot about the power of good ideas over bad ideas, which is something that I, you know, I share as well. I think ideas are very important. Discussing them is very important, which is one of the reasons we do the show. But one of the things you, you mentioned in the book and you make quite, quite clear is that this ideology that we're talking about, the ideology of social justice, of diversity and whatever, it will not be defeated through ideas because they're not fighting that cultural war through ideas. They're fighting it through institutions, which they've seized control over, right? So what is the answer, Ben? You've got about 30 seconds to come up with a blueprint for how we solve this crisis of Western civilization. Go. I, well, I don't think there isn't a silver bullet. I, mean, I was joking. I know there's no silver bullet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. fucked. <laughs> fucked, fucked, I tell you. But, <laughs> but I, I think it's, it's, it's basically about all of us who are concerned and give a shit mm. that we, we do get active and we organise and we contact each other and we form institutions. And to do that, you need money and you need people prepared to put in hard work. And, you know, this, this takes time. I mean, like I say, with, with the book, you know, sort of exploring this idea of a system of diversity. And I didn't use that word by mistake. It's, you know, it's systemic in a sense. Um, but you can, you can break out of it, but you're taking a risk when you do. Everyone is taking a risk. And uh, to, to, make, to make any sort of politics which is withdrawing away from that or criticising that, while preserving, you know, the elements which are good, hopefully, um, has, has got to, you know, be organised and, and rigorous and well-financed. Um, 
So, I mean, this, this isn't easy. We, we don't do it just by sitting and pontificating. Mm. Um, like we do here. Yeah, um, like, like I'm doing. Yeah, yeah like we're doing. Well, uh, I think the Ben made a very eloquent point there that we need money. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway. Yeah. Um, Give them money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and uh, we'll be plugging your book in a second. But um, final question, Francis. Right, so this is how we always like to end our, our, our interviews, Ben. Um, so what is the important thing uh, that um, we are not talking about at the moment as a society, but actually we really should be? Well, it's something, I mean, I, I would say that I, you know, I find it uncomfortable to talk about myself and, and that talking, the more we do talk about it, the more uncomfortable things do get. But it's, it's Islamism. Oh, I'll see you later, guys. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> which, no, tell us. Go on, tell which, us. You know, which is, I mean, I think a lot of our, you know, our public sphere, they really do, uh, I mean, want, want to sort of put it away. Mm. Know, that it doesn't really exist out there but it's you know as I as I found sort of exploring the themes of the book um, it's very it's a very powerful form of politics mm -hmm. it's it's very linked into the left and the liberal left and even beyond that uh, and you know it's, it's very organized I mean that's the characteristic of it so I, I, th I think just um, being honest and um, as, I, as I like to think I do in the book just describe to have more description of what's going on in that in that sort of world in our public sphere um, would be very valuable i think mm. fantastic uh, listen before we uh, let you go tell everybody your twitter handle is so it's at ben cobley at um, ben cobley b e n c o b l e y perfect we'll put that in in the youtube video as we always do get this book it's fantastic both francis and i have read it we really enjoyed it you know it's a good book when francis has read it yeah absolutely it doesn't happen very often no. um, and uh, yeah, check out Ben's work. You've got a blog as well, if you want to tell us about that. Yeah, that's called a, a free left blog. Um, I, I don't write so much for it now, um, but there's, there's over, I think, about 150 articles on there, a lot of them about identity politics. Fantastic. Yeah. So check all of that out. And of course, we are at TriggerPod on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, we're going to be moving away from Patreon over time. We're still there for now, but we've got Subscribestar and PayPal, which is how you can support us making this show. Uh, is there anything else we need to mention? Yes. If you like the show, um, could you please leave us a message? We're up to 29 reviews on a, on iTunes. Sounds um, so pathetic. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with... That's <laughs> rubbish. <laughs> Look, I find this hate speech disgusting, can I just say, and I'm offended. And as somebody who is half Latin American, you're all oppressing me. Fuck you. Mm. But no, uh, please leave us a message on iTunes. Uh, if you like it, why don't you tell somebody about it? Retweet, spread the word, uh, subscribe. Just keep telling people about it. Maybe not at work because it will get you fired, but maybe just, you know, uh, in your own personal life. Though not on WhatsApp because you're all getting tracked anyway. So there we go. All right. And uh, remember, subscribe to us, obviously, on YouTube and click that bell button next to the subscribe button to make sure you get every episode sent straight to you so that you know what we've got coming. Uh, if you are a subscriber of ours, we'll be putting loads of stuff out on Patreon and Subscribestar and elsewhere to let you know what's going on, going on. We've got some absolutely fantastic guests, just like today's, uh, coming over the next month or so. So keep an eye out and keep supporting us. And we will see you in a week's, in a week's time. Thanks a lot. See you later, guys. Bye. Bye.